Flashback to being in the thick of the global pandemic. The timely access to vaccines became an unexpected pressure point on our healthcare system. Lines were blurred between various stakeholders as they scrambled to coordinate, leaving many pondering, how could a system under strain respond effectively to such an immediate crisis? As the stakes rose, the challenge was not only about delivering care, but also about providing credible information, ensuring interoperability and safeguarding patient experiences. It was a pivotal moment that called for rapid innovation combined with strategic collaboration. So what does it take for government bodies and healthcare vendors to put aside traditional boundaries and work together swiftly for the greater good? And how do we measure the actual impact of these partnerships? And what can we learn from their successes and hurdles? Well, on the show today, Sophie Turner from Talking Health Tech speaks with Travis Hodgson from Health Direct Australia, Aaron D'Souza from MedAdvisor, and Anish Kalpakam from HotDoc. And in this episode, we talk about the origin and evolution of the Vaccine Clinic Finder and its transition to encompass wider healthcare appointment facilitation, the intricacies of building and leveraging existing technology amongst rapidly evolving public health strategies, and we consider the vast potential for future projects harnessing the collective strengths of government and health tech industries. Collaboration starts with the conversation, Team Health Tech. Let's make it happen. Welcome to Talking Health Tech, featuring content and community about technology and healthcare. We acknowledge the traditional owners of lands these conversations were recorded and pay respect to elders past and present. Welcome to today's episode of Talking Health Tech. I'm Sophie Turner, your host today, and today I'm joined by three dynamic and energetic guys from Health Direct, Hot Doc, and MedAdvisor Solutions. I'm going to throw to them to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about who they are and what they do. Do you want to start us off, Travis? Thanks very much, Sophie. Uh, Travis Hodson, Chief Operations Officer at Health Direct Australia. It's great to be here, particularly with our colleagues, uh, Anish and Aaron. Uh, I look after services and engagement at Health Direct, so that's both our platform services as well as those that we deliver in partnership uh, with industry and service providers. Uh, that's the health information and advice service, uh, the core Health Direct service, which supports more than 2 million Australians each year with seeking health information, advice and connection to care, uh, as well as the My Age Care service, uh, video call service, pregnancy, birth and baby service, uh, and the head to health service. Great. Thank Lovely. you. Thanks, and Travis. Aaron. Hi, my name's Aaron D'Souza. I'm a pharmacist and I work at MedAdvisor Solutions where I help uh, the federal governments uh, and uh, agencies as well as state governments deliver um, uh, healthcare programs uh, across a network of about 5,800 community pharmacies across the country. Um, and we also have a patient medication app. So we have that connection into the consumer domain. We have bookings. And what it results in is a uh, an integrated and uh, diversified, uh, differentiated system of clinical um, uh, information systems as well as patient communication systems uh, so that uh, we can connect uh, the community uh, at a local level through to uh, federal digital health initiatives uh, such as electronic prescribing and, of course, the wonderful um, health direct uh, bookings integration as well. Amazing. Anish? Thanks, Sophie. Uh, hi, I'm Anish. I'm the head of partnerships at HotDoc. And for those of you who have used HotDoc, HotDoc's historically been a patient engagement platform. And over the years, you know, we've transitioned from patient engagement to optimizing front desk operations. And now we really are focusing on innovating how we can connect the 21,000 GPs and 11 million patients that interact with us um, to a, another level. And our North Star is always ensuring that patients' healthcare needs are met through Hot Doc. And you know, the best way we can do this is by helping GPs work more efficiently. Thank you. So we've got quite a, um, a fun little bunch to have a conversation today. Travis, can you tell me a little bit about how these collaborations came about and what events led to you guys working with HotDoc and MedAdvisor Solutions? Sure. 
Thanks, Sophie. The genesis of uh, the Health Direct Service Finder, it actually came about in response to the pandemic, um, specifically the vaccination campaign. Uh, initially, the call to action from government around early uh, 2020, January, uh, was to stand up a national hotline, the National Coronavirus Helpline, mm-hmm. uh, capable of taking tens of thousands of calls a day, uh, supporting consumers with health information and advice, understanding and navigating the ever-changing restrictions, um, eligibility in relation to uh, the vaccinations that were on the horizon, um, and uh, and general health information advice and medical escalation. Um, in those early days, there we surged the contact centre, uh, reaching um, more than 40,000 consumers a day um, with inbound contact centre calls. Uh, but we quickly realised that digital information and access channels could help to reduce not only that contact centre burden, but could scale rapidly across the population um, to support consumers and empower consumers searching for that information at any time of the day uh, from any location. So in partnership with industry, um, and particularly our colleagues here today, um, I remember being in the trenches, particularly with Aaron, um, in those early days of identifying what suite of tools can uh, we partner on designing and delivering rapidly to the community to support them in this uh, search and access of information. Um, but secondly, as uh, the government were able to procure um, and get access to and distribute vaccines, get those jabs in arms as, as quickly as possible um, and move beyond the initial phase of the pandemic. We, uh, we realised that the NHSD had uh, a significant offering. Um, so part of the principle of, of this program was to leverage existing infrastructure wherever possible. Um, there are a range of challenges as well as opportunities in those early days of repurposing the National Health Services Directory to uh, support uh, the infrastructure components of the Vaccine Clinic Finder, and we'll talk about some of those today. Um, but essentially, uh, the Vaccine Clinic Finder uh, became a digital front door uh, to the healthcare system for uh, consumers looking for um, vaccination information uh, and where to get uh, access and also health information to support them in their journey um, throughout the COVID period. The the VCF, uh, the Vaccine Clinic Finder, it's now transitioned into the Health Service Finder. Uh, it's been used by more than 50 million times uh, since 2020. Um, and it supported more than 2 million Australians uh, getting access to vaccine appointments. So it's a significant enduring component of national digital health infrastructure. Thanks for that, Travis. That's a great overview. Um, I'm sure there were a lot of targeted benefits and I'd love to know more about how this was achieved. Um, Anish, can you tell me a little bit about that from your perspective at HotDoc? Absolutely. Thanks, Sophie. The best way to describe this is almost to paint a bit of a picture. In the early days you know, of the COVID panic, patients would be calling in to the front desk. There'd be a lot of walk-ins. And as a result, it just led to a lot of GPs and nurses in the front desk being overworked and exhausted. So we got a call and just like Aaron and other private vendors in the industry got a knock from the government and effectively asked, you know, hey, we need to build a number of features to help with this process. And what that led to was helping some of these nurses and GPs manage their loads and also send them home and keep them safe, most importantly. And um, this was really just emphasized with the integration of uh, Health Direct. It allowed for patients to be triaged appropriately, you know, making sure that patients are seeing the right appointments for the right vaccine types, capturing consent. All these factors were vital through that phase. The second benefit that I could think of, COVID really created this, this pressure cooker of an environment where public and private were forced to work together. And what that happened and what that led to was a really collaborative environment where all of us could deliver something that was previously unattainable. And, you know, as a result, it's really set up the foundations for all of us to function in a cohesive unit, hopefully to work towards a more interoperable future. Thanks, Anish. Um, Aaron, do you have anything to add to that from your perspective? Yeah, similar to what Anish has uh, has has described there, it's about the narrative. I mean, we can talk about technology all day long, but the truth is, it's about the human experience behind it, and the 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 the, the honest facts about the situation. Everyone loves a facts guy, right? Um, uh, and and bringing statistics into a conversation. 
But uh, on average, Australians, the average Australian walks into a community pharmacy 13 times a year in a metropolitan area. Uh, a, a 97% of people in a metropolitan area are 2.5 kilometres away from their community pharmacy. If you scream loud enough, uh, your community pharmacist will hear you. And uh, the luxury of being able to just go home was not there for community pharmacists and pharmacy staff, pharmacy assistants, dispensary technicians during the pandemic. In fact, what they had to do is split their workforces so that they could continue to serve their communities, could continue to be there because pharmacy is a highly physical uh, environment and that accessibility part of it is, is, uh, is, is part of the equation of why community pharmacies exist. So um, technology had to play a significant role in communication and connecting patients into their community pharmacy. They needed more uh, connection um, uh, because, of course, they couldn't leave their homes, but they still needed to get down to the pharmacy at some point uh, to engage with their community pharmacy. And, um, yes, an issue is uh, correct. The exciting times of the pandemic um, from a technology perspective, we were able to uh, connect those patients through to their community pharmacy when, in fact, they didn't even know that pharmacies could do half the services that pharmacies could do. And I'll give you an example there. In 2014, uh, I was blessed to be one of the first community pharmacists in the country to be able to immunise um, patients, and that was 2014. And we fast forward eight years later, and still community pharmacy was only doing less than 19%, less than 19% of flu vaccinations in the country. And that during the pandemic, we saw there was a desperate need for, for pharmacy to be part of the vaccine rollout. And now we see that well above that 30 to 40% mark, uh, depending on, on, on the, 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 the values that you use. I told you I had a lot of facts today. So uh, that, that showed that there was great demand in pharmacy, but booking a time where you could go into the, your community pharmacy absolutely critical. We'll give you one more narrative. We had a pharmacy in rural New South Wales call me and say, as I cannot get off the phone to serve customers because every minute I'm getting people asking me for X, Y, and Z, I, I need to actually do the work. My workforce has been split into team A and team B in case we have one person in our team who gets covid so we can then load balance and, and, and mitigate our risk. How do I do it? And I said, mate, bookings, you've got to get your bookings on. That is going to reduce your calls. And he had a thousand fold kind of decrease in his, in his calls coming through so he could serve the community correctly or his whole staff could serve the community correctly. That's what technology can do. That's the outcome of great technology journeys but more importantly, this is why it was so powerful working with Health Direct because it was done on a coordinated and national basis. We were able to get one message out. There was a door, a very clear door that you could walk through. There was no wrong door, but there was a clear door that you could work, walk through. And that really gave us a lot of power in um, the um, in, in, in the um, provision of great service throughout that pandemic. And really, look, it was one of the factors that broke the back of their pandemic, in my humble opinion. Aaron, I like the point you make about no wrong door. Um, and that narrative rings true to all of the services that, that Health Direct are delivering now. And indeed, um, in our various organisations, you know, we support a variety of clients uh, in service delivery that doesn't necessarily need to come through any particular channel. But Reflecting on those early days in the response um, and the capability of what was essentially a vaccination eligibility checker at the time, which then took you through this basic view of the National Health Services Directory for services such as pharmacies and general practitioners, all that was exposed to the consumer was a phone number. Um, and so it was a great solution uh, that gave you a bit of an endpoint as to well, what, what options are available to get a jab in an arm. Um, but of course, that then led to this significant inbound contact burden that pharmacies and others were experiencing, practice managers, etc. And there was a point in time where we were thinking, do we need to actually mask the numbers? 
um, because you you had this significant administrative burden that you weren't able to deliver care. Um, so I remember getting in the room uh, together with uh, the various clinical uh, and industry peak bodies and the consumer peak bodies and talking through what are the solutions that are available to us. And that's when the booking providers uh, came to the party with some potential solutions. Uh, I remember talking, I think it was AAPM at the time, the Australian Association for Practice Managers, um, talking through uh, the significant agency resources that they had to surge during that particular time of inquiry and then the significant downward um, demand that they experienced when the online booking services came to light. Um, so I think that's definitely one of the key benefits in, in addressing, you know, public campaign, call to action, uh, you know, call, call the pharmacies and call the GPs. And of course, this was able to address some of that. But the best, the best uh, experience that I remember uh, consumers telling us that they got out of this program was uh, taking a federated uh, directory approach so that the service finder actually aggregated all available appointments across all major vendors across the entire health landscape. So it was a single uh, view across the health system. Um, so although HotDoc had great strengths, Health Engine had great strengths and customer bases, etc., cetera, um, this brought it all together so that you had this platform view across the sector to determine where makes sense for you to attend, when is suitable, and what are some of those accessibility requirements and inclusivity needs as a consumer that makes sense uh, based on your own individual preferences. And I, th I think another part of that, Travis, on the, on the other side of it, receiving end, that we didn't have to have a change management process, which basically through technology, potentially at, uh, at practice managers, at pharmacy assistants, at pharmacists, I have to learn something new. No, use the software that you've got, right? Yeah. We're just going to plug into it. If we've, yep. we've got, you know, we've got the highways built. We don't have to rebuild the highway, right? You just just keep keep going on on that. We're just going to put a few more roads that that actually flow into this highway. And and I think that was um, uh, it, it's it's underreported. It's it's really not appreciated that that made a huge difference when there was enough change. We're talking punctuated change to the normal equilibrium of of daily life in communities across the country it wasn't another and this is the human part part of it it wasn't another webinar that i had to sit on to learn another piece of software for my 15 staff members uh who actually serve our customers right so i don't have to do that i don't i don't have to then buy new software or i don't have to have it installed i don't need to worry about you know which browser do I have to use for this to actually work? And then let's let's let let's let's face the truth about it. Efficiencies matter. That ability to kind of go, right, I'm gonna have this information source coming from this way, but I actually do my majority of my work over here. So how do I actually am I copy and pasting the entire time? Those things really make a difference. And the approach that was taken and that engagement about saying, hang on, what assets have we actually got across the country that are, are, in, are native? How do we use those? How do we harness that power and that momentum? And momentum is everything as as we know, and we can see that. You, you mentioned it before. It started with the Vaccine Clinic Finder, and now it's got momentum into a range of uh, you know a diversified uh, options for patients as well. And initially, I'm sure that you know at Hot Doc you had the same type of experience. You were able to actually use the you know use the power of your network um, rapidly. Yeah, absolutely. Just adding on to Travis's point there, I think the um, what I really appreciated about health health direct infrastructure was the ability to triage, triage at a much earlier level than some of the booking providers and some of the other private vendors. And what I mean by that is, you know, as Travis mentioned, Health Direct historically has been a information source for a lot of patients. And what it has the ability to do is effectively triage people that are effectively in this environment where they're panicked, potentially a lot of pressure. They don't really have access to their regular healthcare professional because the healthcare professional is also nervous and they're also overworked. So realistically, they don't have the ability to contact them. And just having uh, having the ability to say, hey, this is potentially a scenario where you just need to go and read this information, or this is really important, go see your ED, 
Or in another case, okay, this might be a specific circumstance for you to seek care. And once you do that, obviously lead the right patient to the right healthcare provider for the right appointment type. And I think that sort of segment is really important. And, you know, we didn't get it right uh, in the early days, but it took some time and eventually we configured that and, you know, it led to a superior patient experience eventually. Yeah, that momentum piece and what you guys have been talking to is is so important. I'd love to go back and and find out, sort of dive into more of those barriers from the technology side and then also how you address the um, privacy concerns, especially when we're working across so many different agencies at different level, levels from private to government. How did you address them in such a, a rapidly evolving landscape? So I think um, the tricky the tricky parts for us were actually more around the policy landscape and the vaccines that were released, the multiple iterations of the vaccines. Now, obviously, we we knew that COVID was going to be sort of an evolving beast, but not to the degree that it ha- not to the degree that it actually happened. And you know, we had different eligibility criteria based on age based on a number of other different variables um, and the frequency of updates were were quite intensive. And what that means from a technology perspective is that you have teams of developers working late hours, sometimes overnight to deliver on the federal government, the state government's timelines. And it's not as simple as just meeting a deadline because these changes and features have real life impact on patients and people might be seeing the wrong appointment if some of these features aren't delivered. So that was a really tricky part for us, ensuring that we had to ship these iterations of vaccine types for the right patient type as soon as possible across our GP network. And I'm sure Aaron can empathize with that because not every GP business is the same. Everyone is unique and how they function is quite unique. How they'd like to set up their flow is unique. So negotiating with the GP to help them set up uh, an optimal system for them, but at the same time meeting a lot of these policy requirements, um, that was quite difficult. So if anything, it's just a big shout out to my, you know, amazing product and CX team. They have they did a fantastic job. And I'm sure, you know, Aaron could probably speak the same thing. In terms of privacy and security, uh, you know, Hotak is uh SOC to type one accredited and we have some of the highest um degree of security. So that's um in the industry, in the private industry. So in terms of that that's already been a historic component of our um, SaaS software. So not, none of that really changed. But as I was saying, it was more the, the policy landscape that was quite difficult for us. And I guess the the final part is working with multiple different stakeholders across the industry. So you've got different government organizations, PHNs, private vendors like HotDoc and MedAdvisor, all aligned for the first time in potentially a very long time for a common goal. And that hasn't been done before. And making sure that our funding models, the way our cadence of working, we're all aligned to actually deliver this 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 seamless service that ideally addressed the patient and the practitioner's needs. That was difficult, but we got there. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I can reflect those comments as as well. Um, I, I think um, from a from a society perspective, we in t- in that pandemic, uh, there was so much uncertainty, and as human beings, what we really focused on is okay well what are the points of certainty what are the true certain things in my life and what do we go back to we went back to you know uh, the human relationships that we had you know jumping online and and you know singing a song and 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 doing you know a, a team's meeting of you know with with a glass of wine and cheese with family members across the country the points of certainty were those human human connections and the people that we genuinely trusted and i think if we we bring that into this domain of technology, there was great risk that uh, bad actors in uh, uh, overseas or or in the country could have quite easily targeted the uncertainty and the the panic, and then created uh, you know a, 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 an environment of danger for the average person who is just trying to get the right information at the right time with the right person. So by connecting through the federal government, who was taking the lead, and the state governments as well uh, in each jurisdiction, taking the lead and giving points of certainty and foundational aspects, we were able, I think, to use a network of existing trusted local people, nurses, uh, doctors, um, uh, pharmacists, 
uh, to be able to uh, to give people options and a sense of certainty. And if we overlay that with uh, the the job that software vendors did, uh, and you mentioned your credentials, uh, ISO twenty seven thousand and one. So many software vendors uh, go for, for for that credentialing. There was certainty in that. There was credibility from a government perspective that, yes, I'm connecting through with a credible organization, right? So we can create pathways of safety and certainty and then giving people true options of, actually, I'm looking at the Health Direct website and there's a a clinic I've never been to before or a pharmacy I've never been to before. I've driven past it, but it's listed here. It must be a credible source of healthcare for me. I think that is a really important part of it. And that whole network effect that we got by saying, here is a, a genuine, credible government, you know, approved pathway. And guess what? It actually connects you with trusted, credible local people that you can get um, action from information into action was a really powerful tool. And alongside that, again, back to that point around using existing infrastructure, existing terms of use, existing privacy policies, existing confidentiality, and existing um, cybersecurity credentialing, uh, that was um, a significant um, uh, activator of what we were able to achieve. And when we look back at it, even though the pandemic felt like a very long time, in terms of technology development and uh, that punctuated equilibrium, if we look back at it, it was actually a pretty short time in terms of being able to deliver something of um, uh, of great importance and of great impact um, uh, to to the community. Getting through that pandemic was uh, was pretty significant in the in the timeframes that we had. Travis, I'll, I'll let you uh, take the conversation from here. Yeah, look. Uh... You know, you talk about leveraging existing systems to the fullest extent possible. That was probably one of our major principles, design principles, wasn't it, Aaron? I think um, Health Direct could have, uh, the government could have gone down the path of developing its own system, um, and uh, which would have uh, been a very dangerous uh, game to play in terms of, you know, widespread adoption, um, unnecessary disruption to the sector, um, and really, it would have been a real shame and missed opportunity to the repurposing of this infrastructure. And we'll talk a little bit later on in this cast about what does this mean for the future. Um, but the foundations were already there. So being able to repurpose and better integrate those foundations across the network ensured that we could aggregate that to the consumer at the highest possible level so that it was empowering them to make those decisions about where they go to next and what choices they make in relation to their health and care situation. Um, some of the other challenges, um, there were many, weren't there? Um, I'm just thinking about the top five um, that we overcame together. Probably from a more operational lens, um, some of the challenges were uh, the evolving policy landscape um, meant you know, rapid release. Um, and I was talking to one of our product guys this morning and just queried, how many releases did we actually do? Is it, did we ever count that? Um, I'm sure Hot Doc um, and Health Engine counted it. Um, but from our perspective, we did quite a lot of changes at the eligibility lens. So this was the front layer to the vaccine clinic finder, and that was changing rapidly. You know, there were times when we did more than 10 changes in one week, um, following advice from um, the various advisory forums, Tavi and a couple of others, um, in each of the states, territories, and the Commonwealth, um, and uh, and those changes kept us on our toes, and we did have a twenty four seven team on uh, the digital channels as well as the contact centre channels. So it meant that we had the resource scalability to flex um, and resolve those issues. But it, there was a heavy dependency on industry, and there was a huge dependency, even bigger dependency on frontline uh, uh, clinicians um, and uh, the technicians in pharmacy supporting them. Uh, so I do remember, uh, you know, there were quite a there were quite a number of changes at times when it just felt like it would never stop. Um, but uh, together, uh, you know, the collaborative decision making forums that we had established, um, you know, the the overwhelming participation um, across the sector in the decision and design forums um, was incredible. Um, you know, I don't think there were many 
meetings, even even though the uh, cadence was weekly. I don't think there were many design meetings that we didn't have a representative from every part of the sector, um, whether it was clinical peaks, consumer peaks, uh, the medical software industry association or vendors themselves sitting around a round table um, to share in the design of these solutions and make decisions together uh, was really the strength in the model. One of the other challenges, of course, um, was harmonising roadmap priorities. So obviously, uh, you know, although we were in a pandemic, um, you had other priorities as well to support the access to healthcare, health, uh, the pandemic and, and the coronavirus, um, as challenging as it was. Other components of the healthcare system needed to continue to operate for which you both had pivotal roles. Um, so ensuring that we could harmonise and prioritise what was essential um, between each of our organisations for this particular user journey, I think everybody took a really responsible approach to this. You know, there was some exotic and sexy features that were on a longer term roadmap that different vendors and Health Direct themselves had. Um, but we all agreed that what was in the critical path to achieving this particular user outcome um, was pretty well harmonized across the landscape. Um, we didn't let perfect get in the way of good. Good. Yeah, and and I, yeah. I I I you know echo that uh, from a from a vendor perspective, uh, uh, the uh, it was delightful and surprising <laughs> to uh, to see that engagement because it's not usual that you're working with you know whether it's in the private sector or or in the public sector um, whether you're working with a partner there's always uh, a fr- friction points um, and sometimes there, there's significant barriers significant friction points uh, but it seems to be that uh, in in this situation. Um, each other's best interests were always put, uh, you know, at the centre of the of the conversation. It was a genuine win win or no deal situation, uh, and so for us, uh, yeah. yes, massive roadmap problems. You know, we we you know we uh, we always used to joke about when can we get our roadmap back um, because it was like you just kind of went, all right, it's just a, it's written in pencil now, and 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 everyone's got a pencil that they can write on my roadmap. Um, uh, so you you were actually you know kind of working in consultation, but but that that is very true. There were there were there were uh, clear timelines which were reasonable and flexible, which is great. Like things always happen, you know, demands always happen from the network in in software. So having that um, approach, I think, was was um, you know a, a, a shining light of how um, a public part private partnerships can work, and and I mean it can work because it worked and it was so exciting and quite professionally satisfying as well anish um i think you uh, had some yeah. uh, extra comments too yeah i i agree with that um aaron and i think just reflecting upon it you know the biggest learning for hot dark and the private and public vendors is that working towards a higher goal in this scenario being COVID and delivering a fantastic patient experience and keeping a healthcare professional safe had really brought a number of different stakeholders together in a way that yes we have to set aside some of our roadmaps and it also helped us prioritize what's important and it really changes the narrative of what's important for the healthcare system in the future and it's set up some nice foundations to potentially collaborate in the future um, and using that sort of principle or, or sort of guardrail almost for future projects is a really good uh, way to look to collaborate whether it's med advisor health direct um, and you know travis maybe Travis will likely talk about this in um, in the next segment, but um, you know what the future looks like, and uh, how you know all of us can work together. So we might we'll we'll park the future for just a second, but I'm I'm intrigued about being able to how government and industry really came together in the in this whole process. What's been what's been left on the table there in terms of um, how you guys see? potential benefits in in further integrating those relationships between government and industry. Um, maybe, Anish, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, sure. So um, I think specifically with with what we'd actually worked on with the Vaccine Clinic Finder, the remnants of that, there are so many different applications. I'll start off there. So Vaccine Clinic Finder transitioned to having availability of medical appointments. That's a project that um, Health Direct had recently um, commissioned for some of the private vendors, the booking vendors. And beyond vaccinations, you know, GP is a big segment of ours and that's something that we can assist. And that was a very easy solution, similar to what Aaron was saying. The infrastructure is already in place. Uh, we, we have a successful integration. So really just showcasing that availability wasn't difficult for us. 
And, um, you know, that's led to more access to patients that are coming um, to Health Direct and now to Health Talk. And there's other elements that are a little bit more nuanced um, for us in terms of, you know, what some of that infrastructure is being used for now. And that's more around the delivery of urgent care. Uh, and that's a, a, an important initiative for us as well, because we have identified along with federal and state governments and PHNs that there are a subsegment of patients that require access to a specific type of care that doesn't necessarily align with their usual interactions with their GP. And what that means is they need a specific flow, a specific patient flow to help them see their healthcare professional in a manner that will get them uh, immediate access. So that's been a, a really interesting sort of um, relationship that's developed as a as a result from the interaction between the public and private sector. And that's just one example. And, you know, the, in terms of the initiatives that we can potentially work on with the federal and state governments, that's, you know, it's, it's unending. And I think Health Direct is, is a fantastic sort of intermediary almost that can connect the private and public health sector. And I think that's sort of a, a fantastic role for the future. Um, whether it's urgent care services or um, other healthcare services that we can deliver to the public, sorry, to the patients or healthcare professionals. Aaron, I'm sure you have some things to comment on that in regard as well. Uh, ab- absolutely, Anisha. I, I think, um, you know, what, what about great problems in healthcare is that patients don't know that they can actually access uh, solutions for their, their problems. And uh, what we uh, know is that patients turn to Dr. Google and then they Google all of their stuff and they get so much information, which is ultimately, um, the majority of it's coming from overseas, they're actually, they, they, they reach a void. And the void is, but who can help me? Like, can I, I can try all of this stuff. And there's this, this point of I've got all of this certainty and I've got all this information and then I can't actually do anything. I think that's the bridge, which is Health Direct, and the beautiful naming of of the of of, of the entity uh, is is perfect. It's Health Direct. I can directly get uh, care, and it's not just um, you know the credible source of information. It is here are people who can help you, genuine people in your local area, two point five kilometers away from your home, who can help you. That as a foundation means that uh, we have a problem, and the problem is. How do we regain the laser focus that we had during the pandemic to yep. get through key priorities and and in key initiatives that are funded, right, at a local level, it's funded by government to say these are problems which are causing us significant economic problems in productivity, um, in, in, in costs to the healthcare system at the emergency ward. Here are people who can get ahead of the game and actually help you now that you know that you've got that problem. And I think yeah. that is the, whatever that shape that takes, I don't have a specific example, but whatever yeah. shape that takes, we've got to start working through that laser focus of this is a problem. And and that's potentially where, you know, the, the health direct leadership comes from, you know, it yeah. can't just be uh, hot doc leading and, and med advisor leading because we'll lead in what is best for us. Uh, it's about finding that middle ground of going, yeah, actually, this is really good for everyone if we have laser focus on these key initiatives yeah. moving moving forward. So yeah. it's a it's a bit of a broader answer to the question, Sophie. However, um, the, the 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 solution um, is 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 from roundtabling and 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 key initiatives that uh, that the government has, um, uh, and and it comes through um, you know the yeah. entity like 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 Health Direct. Travis, I'm sure you've got more to add mm-hmm. on that. Yeah, look, in terms of uh, the partnership with industry, I think the the COVID experience was a significant growth journey for uh, Health Direct, um, not only in our service model, which went from a traditional health advice model to now actually facilitating connected care, uh, thanks to this partnership with the booking solutions. Um I think when we look towards the future and the foundations that we've developed, one of the principles that we need to continue carrying is uh, if it exists elsewhere, we don't build it. Um, so Health Direct's not in the game of building technology solutions, um, you know, in an effort to compete. Um, that's absolutely uh, not part of our future. Um, our future is the reuse of assets and the integration between systems 
and healthcare providers across healthcare settings to ensure that we can optimize the consumer experience. And whether that means fast tracking access and, um, you know, for patients who need it most, um, or ensuring greater continuity of care across pathways or out of pathways, I think there's a fundamental role for industry in helping to provide the architecture and infrastructure for that particular journey. What we found really useful um, even recently in the uh, transition from the vaccine clinic finder into the service finder um, was working through uh, the future use cases. Um, And obviously that's what we're about to discuss next, Sophie. But um, uh, the future use cases, uh, particularly around urgent care, um, which is not necessarily a future use case now, we're we're deep in the thick of it. Um, But being able to manage or at least divert uh, traffic to where capacity exists Um, and the ability, the surveillance by having access into a booking module at a particular endpoint of care does give us through the nurse contact centre a level of assurance uh, that we can connect patients to where care capacity exists. Um, you know, rather than rocking up an emergency department for which you have no idea how long you'll be waiting for a particular condition, adding a triage layer that matches uh, services scope of practice with the symptoms that a patient is presenting with gives us that ability to uh, connect people to care that is going to uh, respond to their needs rapidly. Um, uh, some urgent care clinics have booking uh, capacity built in. Um, others are purely walk-in. Some are hybrid. I think in about 12 months' time, it'll be great to evaluate which of these models are best, um, whether it's a hybrid, whether it's a booking entry with a triage gate at the front door being digital uh, or telephony, or whether the walk-in model, uh, you know, like a traditional ED is, is the best approach in terms of efficiency and uh, both in terms of technical efficiency and allocative efficiency. So, so you're saying that you don't you don't like wild elephants, mate? Is that is that the uh, <laughs> is, that what, is, is that what we're oh, saying? That's oh. good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let but, you commentate on that, Aaron. Yeah. But, tra- <laughs> but Travis, just on that point, actually, um, you know, an ask for the listeners, um, potentially not naming names, potentially in government organisations. Let's setting aside the technology aspect. I think what we absolutely should continue to do on the back of COVID is continue to develop relations between industry and the public sector. And yes, Health Direct is a fantastic intermediary. But you know, if the government has questions, the federal or state have questions around pharmacy or primary care, we exist. We would love to sit down and brain, you know, go through some sort of workshop experience to identify future use cases or address existing problems. This is the way forward. Um, We all have specialized knowledge. And, you know, if we do have a way that we can collaborate together, even distinctions between state and federal, um, that would really be the future of healthcare. And, you know, we can move as fast as we did in COVID. Yeah. And and to to your point, um, you initially said you've got 21,000 right? 21,000 users uh, across your network. We've got 5,800 community pharmacies across our network. I mean, if you want rapid movement and if you want efficiencies, that's where it lies. And I'm I'm sure there's plenty other companies out there, uh, software vendors, Mm. who've got their network. And that, that, that leverage, that leverage is is so this is far more powerful right for yeah. the community for you know for, yeah. for people so so we don't see that that one pharmacy or you know two pharmacies in a certain you know area of, of Australia if they don't get the software until their software vendor actually gets it onto the roadmap and then yeah, does the interest exactly. we're talking about six months later that people are suffering that's not okay. Like we've got to, we've got to move. If we want to move fast, we want to, we want, we want to get these yeah. efficiencies out there. Uh, all those human yeah. factors uh, are, are are in the way if we if we don't use existing yeah. existing infrastructure. But, but also on that note, Aaron, you know, if um, if I was a government organisation and I had a problem that I wanted to solve in the pharmacy landscape, um, who better to talk to than a network of five thousand that has potential oversight of a five thousand network of um, clinics right so you will have yeah. those insights and and i and i get i genuinely get just just to take a very slight tangent i i get why governments think hang on 
maybe we should build this ourselves where we're mm. going to get the solution that we want like the the perfect solution you know is is it is it yeah. the enemy of good though is, is is what you know travis was saying before yeah. but you know the the truth is go out if it's if it's truly emergent uh, an emergent area where you go you know what no one else has done this yeah. There is no other solution out there and, and no other vendor could actually potentially um, uh, put this in there. I get it. Uh, yeah. Set the standard. You know, yeah. invest the or money, Or if there are any the bad standard. eggs. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you, you set the standard. You know, Microsoft did that when they when they said, hang on, the hardware vendors are not delivering hardware, which is actually going to match our rate of change and our rate of development of software. So let's go out there and make Surface Pros, you know, and, and let's let's yeah. set the standard. But the truth is we have a mature software community. MSIA uh, brings all of that together. Um, you know, it's, it is natively a, uh, an asset for the country to be able to have private companies with such maturity in both cybersecurity and you know development processes, um, uh, I, I, I think that um, you know uh, to the point that Safe was really started us off on around what is you know what what are the the capabilities here? It's our choice. It really is our choice, and and the the speed of which we can deliver um, without patting ourselves on the back, just looking at this objectively, the speed of which we can deliver is actually based upon the fact that we've got that level of maturity within the community of software um, vendors out there. And I think through the pandemic, uh, HealthDirect saw that and went, wow, what a great asset that we could actually just leverage straight off this one. So um, the, the, the perfect example, you know, um, uh, is uh, what, did, what did the average person do, the average community person do to get into a pub? They got their phone out and they scanned a QR code. It wasn't that QR codes were new technology. It was existing technology that no one liked and used. But the truth is everyone had a phone with a camera. That got us back drinking in the pub. I mean, get us back to the chicken schnitty, right? It, it, it was that aspect that we went, hang on, we've got something here we can use. We don't have to have something new. People don't have to go out and buy new infrastructure. We've got it right there. Just a just a, a similar example about what we could do. Yeah. So if the government wants chicken schnitty, Right, and at a at a at a four X has to be a four X, right? Four X gold, fine. But um, if they want that, then then use use us. We're the mobile phones. We're the we're the infrastructure, which is a native yeah. av available going forward. Yeah, and we can certainly pick the native Queenslander on the um, <laughs> on the episode today. We've got a bit of time left, so let's really dive into these use cases and what the future what the future is. I'm. Um, Urgent care has been dropped a couple of times. So, Anish, do you want to talk to us about what that means from your perspective? Yeah, just building on what Travis was saying, it's um, it's a very specific appointment type that has recently gained traction because we've had a number of different government entities trying to solve the same problem. And we've realized that um, there is an overburden in, in emergency departments. And the way to do that is actually divert traffic away to a GP or another healthcare professional, if appropriate. And how you do that is by asking a number of different triage questions. So a number of times it would be, you just might need some additional information because the patient is unaware, um, or it could be, you need to go to the emergency department, call an ambulance, or it could be, okay, go. it's not as urgent as you think it is, but go see a GP in your own hours, or this is a scenario where you should actually go see urgent care, in which case, you know, a player like Hot Doc um, or another booking vendor would step in and provide a booking link that's configured by a specific clinic that is seeing urgent care services. That's how that would work. What that does is obviously it uh, broadens the horizon of what a patient can do in terms of optionality when they have a specific condition that requires urgent services and also reduces the burden on emergency department. Of course, we're doing this at a small scale um, at this stage, it's not widely adopted. As Travis was saying, there's multiple iterations of the solution. And I don't think there's a specific solution that necessarily works better than others yet. We still need more data points. But in the next 12 months, we will have more of an understanding of what works and potentially you know, scale at a level where we can address this issue at a wider scale. But that's one use case of you know what potentially 
the future looks like between a collaboration of you know government and private because I don't think just a single entity can do this. Um, this has to be sort of a combined effort for a number of different reasons for funding, um, operational sort of um, problems that you need to overcome. So realistically, yeah, this is a, a great use case. And, you know, there are other use cases, of course, things like chronic disease management, referrals, but, you know, we'll, we'll keep that for another day. But, um, yeah, I'll let Travis and Aaron comment on it if they have any other sort of areas where they see, you know, government industry can collaborate to a better future. Yeah, one of the projects that I'm uh, currently delivering is pharmacist prescribing. There are pilots across the country, um, uh, across um, uh, simple things like uh, u- u- uncomplicated UTIs, uh, uh, um, oral contraceptive, um, but also it's expanding now into 18 categories uh, of of of, uh, of of acute um, uh, uh, ailments um, uh, in um, in Queensland. Um, so that'll that'll kick off in the next uh, a few weeks, actually, uh, and we're really excited to do that. But it's it's, it's again harnessing these uh, emergent practices uh, with um, with uh, with a community, uh, I guess, awareness, uh, and then how, how do we how do we then connect the awareness part uh, to the this is the the human being who can actually help me. So I, I agree, Anisha. I, I think um, you know sitting down and being able to to, to understand each other's roadmaps uh, has uh, has has great. Uh, effect and also really understanding what are the problems that the government is facing you know what are the big challenges um how can we be and i mean it how can we be an asset uh to the government um to actually get outcomes uh, and then also use the data which is available to inform exactly how those outcomes are being you know are being solved and and uh and, and that measurement piece is is really really important and we haven't really spoken about it but what are the mechanisms that we can do to say it's working it's genuinely working because at some point you know government is not going to be able to see absolutely everything each of one of the vendors is going to have a certain amount of information which we can share back and say this is this actually gets results. This is a good news story, but more so, um, there are people getting benefit. There are human beings in less pain um, across the country, uh, and we're going to see uh, great economic um, benefits from from doing that. So, uh, emergent practice is probably the key theme that I've got there. Uh, what can we do moving forward uh, as different industries at different sectors emerge in their scope? Someone mentioned that before. What can we do to uh, to empower the community uh, through through technology connections, Travis? Look, it's no secret that Health Direct um, is continuing to evolve and mobilise resources to become this trusted virtual front door to the healthcare system for consumers. Um, you know, more than five and a half million triages a year, every year, um, even since COVID. Um, more than nine million calls through the various contact centres that are operated. Uh, by Health Direct uh, means it's a trusted source of information and connection to services. Um, what we'd really like to do is um, continue to work with industry and governments to identify use cases that are going to improve the consumer experience. So really focus on what are the learnings through the service finder, the transitioning of that capability to support general access to primary care. Um, we've already done that together. Um, For COVID, we've now done it for general uh, practice, uh, short and long appointments, mental health care planning, um, urgent care now uh, becoming a a core part of that enduring infrastructure. I wouldn't be surprised if in, say, two years' time, uh, some of this capability uh, has become even more routine for searching, finding, accessing and maintaining appointments across the broader healthcare system. So not just primary care, which is the sole setting for which it's currently supporting. Um, I know that there's a couple of jurisdictions which have some appetite for um, leveraging this kind of capability into their specialist outpatient areas um, and uh, and more broadly into the mental health sector um, in community-based programs. I think urgent care is a, is a great space uh, for this phase one evolution of the product. Um, and uh, I think the the evaluation of this particular use case will definitely inform further expansion into the future. 
Great. Thank you. I feel like we could sit here and, and talk all day. Um, you guys have some wonderful insights and it's been a, a great collaboration and to see how you all interact is um, a, a testament to how well and how successful I think the collaboration has been between the three of you. Um, we might leave it there for today. Do any of you have any sort of closing takeaways that you want to leave with our audience before we, we finish and look forward to doing this again in 12 months' time? Uh, look, I, I, the only thing that I'd, I'd add is a successful future is come. It comes about from great communication, and as long as we all continue to get around that round table, we all use uh, the community uh, that's glued together by MSIA. Um, I think that we do have great opportunity. It's the point that we start going back to silos. And we don't have linking pins between all of our organizations. And Travis and I speak and Christian and I speak. And, and I'm sure that's the same with you and Ish and, uh, and Health Direct. But if we can get that collaborative approach back that we have had throughout COVID, we will be able to genuinely move mountains. It's, it's yeah. when we have a competitive environment, which actually doesn't result in any better um, uh, uh, outcomes for our users and for patients that's when everyone loses. So um, I think moving forward, great communication uh, and, yeah. a, and a sense of I'm seeking to understand approach and a culture uh, in our software community um, is, is a critical aspect about it because um, there, is, um, there is a lot of the, 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 the problem of um, uh, health and pain <laughs> from patients. Uh, the pie is very big. <laughs> There's no need to yeah. compete in this area it is more around how do we actually get the best outcomes for our patients yeah. uh, through our health carers and that's what they care about yeah absolutely and, and just on that note aaron absolutely adding an element of proactive communication as well and it doesn't necessarily have to be within our particular silos it could be external to that on that note um you know building those relationships outside of what just we see as a direct operational partner um, might actually lead to potential problems that we don't actually realize exist yet. Uh, and I think that's what um, the future needs to, to work towards. And, you know, part of what we've discussed before is having those workshop sessions together as a unit and it could be a very easy start. And, you know, that just might be an introduction to party XYZ. And, um, you know, that's how good conversations and good projects and relationships start. I think uh, also, you know, the interest-based kind of negotiation approach that we take to all of the projects that we've worked on in the last couple of years, certainly since I've been at Health Direct, um, what I've appreciated from industry and the clinical peak bodies um, has been authentic but respectful engagement. Um, so it's really important to mean what you say and say what you mean, um, but in a way that's respectful and engaging and keeps us at the table together so that we can have this enduring coalition of support in achieving health reform. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Travis, um, all of you for your time today. It's been really insightful and I look forward to seeing what the future holds. Super. Thanks for organising, Sophie, and uh, lovely to chat, Aaron and Travis. You too, Anish. Great to Travis. see you both. Great to see you guys. Thanks, see you later. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Talking Health Tech. Make sure you like and subscribe and share this episode with someone who might find it valuable. For more information and resources about healthcare innovation, visit TalkingHealthTech.com.